Um, so I'll welcome you to the meeting. We do have apologies both from Lee Fletcher and from Richard Wilkins, leader of, uh, um, on, of, of transport at uh, uh, Somerset Council. But the people we do have here are Dave Mansell and Tom Druitt, who are our two speakers. Um, Dave Mansell, I've met on bus rallies in Wiverliskum and elsewhere, battling to improve buses, particularly, but not, not only in West Somerset. Um, he's very active as a councillor in that area. He's also leader of the Green Group, um, on the Green Party Group on Somerset Council. And he's launched a number of initiatives in the Wiverliskum and uh, uh, the Wellington area on buses, including exploring the feasibility of electric buses. So with that build up, Dave, uh, I'll hand over to you. OK, thanks very much, uh, Peter. Um, yes, Lee asked me to cover a few um uh, a couple of aspects, uh, including at Somerset Council and what we're um, doing at our local community network. So uh, I'll cover that. Um, I, I realise that possibly um, the majority on the call are from, from Wiltshire. Uh, I hope that nevertheless, this is it's still still of interest to you. It's always you know good to pick things up uh, across the different counties and uh, we often do hear things from Wiltshire including through this uh, meeting which are which, which are helpful um quick bit on my my background um I, I was a council officer uh, until uh, gosh uh, 2017 um so uh, I used to be the development manager at Somerset Waste Partnership and uh, responsible for the the recycling collections and so on which uh, developed over the years and uh, what I'd like to regard as many pioneering initiatives there. Um, but uh, under previous rounds of cuts at the, the councils and they were looking for voluntary redundancies and I, I, I decided to go for it and at short notice found myself uh, retired and being paid a pension quite unexpectedly. Uh, and nearly as unexpectedly, about a year later, I, I found myself being elected to the council. Uh, going uh, going back when um, one of our local councillors decided to, uh, uh, well, his job circumstances changed, so he's looking for a replacement and asked if I would do it. And it was in my mind, although not necessarily at that time. But anyway, I, I fought a by election and um, was pleased to uh, was pleased to win. So that was Taunton Dean Bower Council 2018. I was then elected again to the new merged Somerset West and Taunton Council. 2019 and then again 2022 uh, which was to Somerset County Council which only had a year left at that time and those of us who were um, elected became the new unitary councillors for Somerset Council which has only been in existence for, uh, for a year. Um, as uh, as Peter said, I, I'm leader of the uh, the, the Green Group. Um, only since the beginning of uh, of, of this year, uh, we're a group of five. the The administration um, are, is the Liberal Democrat group. They have um, sixty odd members. Uh, the second largest group are the Conservatives, who have thirty odd. And then there's three smaller groups, um, which include uh, the Greens five, Labour five, Independents three. Uh, and there's now two others as well in no group at all, one having left the Tories, one having left the Lib Dems. Uh, perhaps they will find a group, but at the moment they, they're they sitting on their own. Um, so uh, I was asked to cover a little bit about scrutiny and thought it's helped to give it a little, in a little bit in context. Um, decisions at, at councils, um, the way most work, is that uh, decisions are taken by full council, so all of the members, um, which in the case of Somerset is 110, um, and a little bit less unwieldy uh, at the executive, which consists of the administering group, um, so Liberal Democrats in our case, which is all the portfolio holders and uh, lead members of which uh, used to be Mike Rigby on transport now, Richard Wilkins, as you're aware. So, uh, 
but there is still a role for, for other members in, in addition to full council in the form of um, scrutiny. We have five scrutiny committees at Somerset and they're politically balanced. So all the groups um, are entitled to uh, seats in proportion to their membership. And one of our five is climate and place and that's where transport um, matters go to. Um, and I have a seat um, on, uh, on that. Um, and our role, we, we can set our own agenda. It's up to us what we think is important to, uh, to, to look at. Uh, that said, a fair amount of what we do mirrors what the executive is doing. And often, um, especially if we've requested it, before the reports go to executive, they come to scrutiny. And we have a look at them, make our comments and sometimes make recommendations uh, for changes. So up till then, they're the officer reports, scrutiny then comments on them and um, uh, and our comments and maybe recommendations get passed on to executive who then take the take the decision. But we can more or less look at anything under the under the functions that we're um, we're scrutinizing. Um, and it actually it, we've actually spent quite a lot of time water issues because there's a lot of concern over water quality the, the council's role is actually limited but it does have some um and as i say we have spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, looking at that um something else we can do is set up working groups um and i must admit i quite quite like those uh, and these are an opportunity to look at something in depth and then bring a report back to scrutiny and then if that gains favour there, that report, again, can also go on to um, executive. Uh, and recently I've chaired one on an energy plan for Somerset, um, which should now next stop, which should be on to the executive after being approved by uh, scrutiny when we reported back um, recently. So that's sort of scrutiny. Now, what we will do, we do get papers on transport and buses and generally try and steer them in the uh, in the right way as we see it um, and draw attention to uh, draw attention to problems so we continue to do that and we will see what happens there is due to be a review of bus subsidies this year um, and there is a transport plan being prepared so there, there are certainly items we will take Somerset is though absolutely impoverished um it, it's it's on the verge of bankruptcy and uh won't say too much but it would not come as a surprise if the bankruptcy notice has to be issued sometime within the next year it, it's nearly expected now the council still functions still has to do statutory duties still has to honor all its contracts um but essentially it, it's not got enough funding for the services provided um, and it's a very difficult time at Somerset Council. Um, we're now at the start of a process whereby there will be over a thousand job losses. Uh, a quarter of the council's workforce um, will will be made redundant, uh, and that process is very much starting. We've got a whole list uh, at the next full council ne meeting next week, which is the first wave, and there will be further waves as the year goes on. So I'm afraid that's the context we're working in and it's pretty awful. Uh, nevertheless, we all do try to make the best of it and things will eventually settle down and we will see what's left. Um, and certainly many of us do believe it's important to protect our bus services and to improve them. But we have to be increasingly creative in uh, ways that may be possible or for government to start funding local authorities in a sensible manner because we certainly don't feel Somerset's fairly funded at the moment and uh, it, it's really coming to a crunch now. Okay, so uh, another thing with the new council is um, local community networks have been set up and I believe you have these in, in Wiltshire. I've certainly heard that you have something similar, perhaps named differently. And essentially, because we had a big unitary set up, which felt more remote from smaller areas and uh, and local communities. The idea was to try and fill this gap with what is called local community networks. And these have only come into being with the new council in the last year. And they consist of, uh, there's 18 altogether in Somerset. 
and they consist of the Somerset councillors for the area, representatives from each of the parishes, uh, plus some representatives from business and community organisations. It's still fairly early days, um, perhaps especially for our one, which is Wellington and Riverlescombe. Um, we're in the western part of uh, the, uh, the the county, uh, so sort of to the west and to the north of uh, of Taunton. Uh, and my patch does cover the sort of uh, it covers Riverlescombe uh, and another thirteen parishes, which go down and more or less encompass. Wellington, but don't. But my patch doesn't include Wellington. There's other councillors that cover that, and but Wellington and Riverlescombe are together uh, in the uh, in the LCN local community network. So, amongst things that we've done is establish early priorities um, for working groups. LCNs can set up working groups. Um, and it was agreed that one of our priorities would be on uh, transport and we've just got the group um, is recently started so we've only had one meeting so uh, so far uh, at the, the meeting we did agree on what our scope should be and it is on public and community transport and especially on uh, on buses so that that will be our will be our focus there's uh, eight or nine of us on the the group so um, uh, parish council representatives, representatives from the bus user groups in Riverlescombe and in Wellington, uh, someone from Transition Town Wellington uh, and from the Riverlescombe Area Partnership, uh, which is quite a significant local community organisation, uh, not least because they run uh, the community office in, uh, in Riverlescombe uh, and also a transport organisation, Wivy Link, um, which has uh, about five vehicles uh, providing community transport service for quite a wide area, actually, beyond the the, the, the immediate Riverlescombe area. Uh, so certainly Wellington and, and even people on the outskirts of Taunton. Um, so they're all on our, our group. Um, at the first meeting, um, it, it was agreed that I would uh, would chair it. We agreed our terms of reference, um, which, as I indicated, uh, you know, identified what we would focus on, and also a work program of what uh, we would aim to to uh, to do. It, it has to be said that a lot of what has prompted this, not only, but a lot of what has prompted this is what's been happening to our main bus service, which is the twenty five, uh, which operates from Taunton to to Dulverton. Um, and covers Milverton, Riverlescombe and other areas in between. And over a number of years, it's just been on a spiral of decline. Every few years, the timetable gets cut back. Um, and each time afterwards, there's less people using it because it's not running when they want it to. Um, and the spiral is continuing. We, we did also used to have other bus services in the past. So until about 10 years ago, there used to be um, a, a service between Riverlescombe and Wellington, uh, directly linking the two and the parishes in between. And that's still much missed. Um, and we'd, we'd like to have it back. And we feel especially now there's a train station to be opened at Wellington. So getting a bus link into that really feels um, uh, essential. We're also very minded that the bus service between Wellington and Taunton is actually very good. It's every, um, I think it's every 15 minutes. Uh, so, uh, you know, it seems an extraordinary service. So uh, if we can link into that, it does actually give a good link from our area into Taunton as well um, with a good frequent, uh, good frequent service because there's two decent sized population centres there. Um, so we are worried about the 25 and it's just been cut again. Um, and we now have three hour gaps in the service. And what were the two peak services at the beginning, two peaks ones into Taunton and the two peak ones out of Taunton, well, one of the peak services has gone. So now everyone's trying to cram on um, what, what's left. And it, it's already meant that as you get closer to Taunton, uh, the bus is sailing past the stops with, sorry, full and uh, not picking up people who want to uh, to get into Taunton. It, you know, it's just oh, crazy. Um, so 
and and it has meant we we're, we're telling we have getting users telling us that the services people were on are no longer on the timetable again and they're now having to make other arrangements for their for their journeys so the signs are that the, the decline could could to could to continue especially when you look at the subsidy on the route and the route has long been subsidised between Riverlescombe and Dulberton by the County Council, now Somerset Council. Uh, the subsidy last year was £107,000, and I presume has gone up by inflation for this year. So a fair chunk of money, um, but still first wanted to cut the timetable. Um, and, uh, and the timetable has been cut, but to prevent it being cut even further than it was um, from uh, from April, the council has had to put in another seventy five thousand pounds, roughly, um, of uh, of of service. But that's one year only, so that's supporting the service, the cut service. Um, uh, but that extra amount, the the seventy five thousand, will run out next March. It's um, a temporary uh, bus service improvement uh, funding. So we, it looks like we're going to be seeing the service cut again next March if we continue on the path where we're, we're currently uh, currently going on. So not surprising this causes lots of concern and, and it is a, a lot behind um, the working group that's set up. And we're thinking we've got to find a different way of doing it. Um, clearly, we're, we're on a spiral of decline, which has been going on now for the last 10 years or more, and it's still heading for more. So we need to find another way of providing bus services in our area. And are we using the subsidy that we've got in the best way and wondering whether we are? Because that subsidy at the moment, because a double deck bus is needed close to Taunton, because it's got the number of passengers there, the double decker bus is full. But as it drops off the passengers, the double decker bus is not so full. So, in fact, half of the journey between Wivelliscombe and Dulverton, there's only a handful of passengers on the double decker bus, but we're subsidising a double decker bus between there. Now, okay, it is the bus. We can't have two buses the way things are organised at the moment. That would cost more. You can see that. But Perhaps it would it be more sensible to have a smaller bus between Dulverton and um, and Riverlescombe, which looks like that would more than meet the need. Um, anyway, that that's you know one thing. We, we, you know, there's a number of things we're wondering: are you know are they is the bus being organised in the most sensible way? And starting to think maybe not. Um, there's other there's other services in the area as well which we want to again sort of think about those in the same way. Um, there's a lot of school transport um, and, for instance, the college students from Dulverton who now go into Taunton, they get their own separate minibus so they don't go on the 25. The council pays for a separate minibus to take them into Taunton and not on the bus. But of course, it loses them then as passengers paying for the bus service. Um, uh, so it, it, is, is that the most sensible thing? Um, I've mentioned we've got Rivy Link, so we've got a very good community organisation providing accessible transport for people who need it. But in addition, the council provides what is called the Slinky service, uh, which is demand responsive. Um, so on several days of the week, it will go to several areas and pick up people on demand. But you have to have booked it um, at least a day in advance. And to be honest, I don't find many people using it. Um, I'm not saying it's a, not a good thing and important, but I know there are a few people use it, but not many. And yet the council has got a bus on standby to come out to these areas. Now, would it actually be better to make that a little bit more scheduled? So the, these are all questions we've got in, in mind. We, you know, we can see a lot of things being individually done and not coordinated together and all of them costing more and, and, and struggling. So that sort of shared um, some of what we're thinking. And I should also mention in the middle of all that, we do have a secondary school in Riverlescombe. Um, because we're a rural centre, it serves a very large rural area all around it. So there's about, I should know the numbers, but I think seven, 800 pupils there. 
but over 80 percent of them are bussed in to the school every day so uh, at the beginning and the end of every day we have a whole succession of buses school buses coming into town you know again can anything be done to to assist with that that, that may be a harder stretch because they are pretty full but you you never know so a lot to to look at and that and that's what we're planning to do with the um, with the working group we've already been doing surveys over the last year asking people what they think before the working group was even thought of so we've got that as some information to um, to, to feed in um, we're very much going to be looking at good ideas elsewhere seeing what community bus services operate in other areas how are they delivered how are they funded how much do they cost so we're really keen to to look at those absolutely love it if we could end up with a situation where we had an electric bus as well we would be very keen on uh, very keen on that um but we will have to see where the working group is going to meet with um with with link um, and they're coming to our meeting uh, next, uh, our second meeting next week. Um, the meeting after that, um, we're inviting um, Somerset Council officers and First Bus to come along. And you, you've gathered the sort of things we're keen to to try and explore with um, with uh, with them. So we're on a, we're on a, a path. You know, we've got an area we want to look at. We will see how we progress on this path now and our hope is that we can come up with ideas for improving the services perhaps to organize them on a complete you know quite a different basis um, and maybe new services operated in a different in a different way we've obviously got to be very mindful of how can they be delivered um, and how can they how can they be funded um, Wivelscombe is particularly an area, though, where communities come together and provide things. We've got a real history of that and many great initiatives in the in the area. We we operate our own swimming pool. We are, we operate our own kitchen to feed you to provide uh, over a hundred meals in the area to people who need it every week. Many many initi initiatives like like that. So. You know, if we've got a good project, the community tends to get behind it in our in our area. So, you know, that's something else we want to, uh, you know, try and func uh, have in mind uh, as we as we move along. So we will see where it all gets to, but and um, uh, we're we're trying to keep focused on our task and progress it along. Um, our aim is to complete our report. Um, by the autumn time, so probably September, October, report back to the local, local community network. And we do expect a bit of um, exchange with the, uh, with the main players. So we won't just sort of tell them what we think they should do. We will make some suggestions to them and see how they respond. You, you know, so we, we hope to try and come up with something that could be deliverable, constructive, um, that, that, that will be the aim. And then if the the, um, the the wider LCN is happy with what we come up with, that can then feed back directly into the executive, possibly scrutiny, but anyway, on into the full council. So that, that's what I've got to got to share and you know, very happy to keep in touch with with everyone. Share ideas, really keen to to do that. And you know, anyone who can help us with what we would like to do, we very much like to, you know, to have contact with you. Okay, thank you. The are, are we allowed to ask questions? We will, but we normally do it at the end. Um, so then, questions to both oh. and to um, Tom. So oh, okay, I'll have to make two lots of notes then. Okay, I'm sure you can cope with that, um, Tom. Yeah, it's. I think everybody knows Tom drew it, so I, I. I will not try and do a build up for him, he's, he's well established. Um, have you got an update for us, Tom? Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, hello everyone. And thanks, Dave, for what very interesting summary of, of uh, what's going on in your neck of the woods. Um, yeah, just a quick update from me. Um, I mean, you remember last time we we're very much uh, focused on um, the the yeah what next after our 
um, unfortunately unsuccessful application for the uh, innovation funding for um, decarbonizing the bus service in Froome. Um, the shortly after that, I did put in uh, in an update that Lee circulated. Um, we uh, we bid for um, all the all the Wiltshire bus services were up for tender, and um, we put in uh, bids for the majority of services that were um, the the majority of town services that were connected with the towns that are represented in this partnership. So we put in uh, bids for uh, Westbury, Warminster, Croome, um, Bradford-on-Avon, Corsham, and um, what's the one I've forgotten? Sorry, M, M, M. Where's Graham from? Melksham. Melksham. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted there, Melksham, yes. <laughs> um, Not Yeah, and, and also Trowbridge. Sorry, also Trowbridge. Yeah. Um, the, the, some of those were connected. So the um, Froome and Trowbridge were connected and also Froome and Warminster were connected. Um. Froome and Westbury. Sorry, Froome and Westbury. Big problem. Um, there were also some interurban services um, <laughs> to Salisbury that we looked at, but um, we we didn't we didn't bid for the interurban services to Salisbury um, mainly because they didn't lend themselves very well to the yeah. kind of community bus model that we have been yeah that we i suppose specialize in but we have also been discussing mainly with within this partnership um and uh they they would require require a, a huge resource which we felt would take resources away from focusing on the community bus services that we've been discussing here and um, unfortunately all of those tenders were not successful um I did some analysis afterwards based on I think the vast majority were won by Froome Bus, which is is great, you know, nice to keep it local and it's independent and so on. So no arguments over over who won the service. And I think they current they operate most of the services already. Um but there are a few questions. It, that it raised in my mind i mean and i think the conclusions from that exercise are very much that um you know unfortunately at the moment uh the the kind of financial conditions around public um yeah public procurement are just not quite ready to um to prioritize the transition to electric or zero emissions. Um, what we're finding in, you know, most, most local authorities have political aspirations to, uh, you know, for carbon neutral, for zero emissions, for, you know, electric innovative solutions and so on. And they just don't have the money to support the reality of actually doing it. And as Dave kind of highlighted a moment ago, um, you know, Somerset's not the only council that's in trouble. I think, I mean, most councils are in various stages of trouble. Um, sounds like Somerset is kind of towards the more critical end of that. But um, there are, you know, the, the vast majority of councils just don't have the money to invest in anything new unless that money is provided by the government. And so we are seeing things like DRT, and BSIT and all of that, but those things are only, you know, they're they're temporary and they're all funded by national government to support national government priorities. Um, money for general, dare I say, from Westminster perspectives, 
boring everyday run of the mill stuff um just gets chipped away every year and you know and the inevitable result is that services get cut back and cut back until they collapse um so that it's not uh yeah it's a it, it's not <laughs> not amazingly um positive kind of outlook but um there were some good lessons from west from wiltshire and the main one i analyzed the the price differences between what we had proposed and what summer uh, sorry what Froombus had had won the bid on and roughly speaking our prices were between 25 and 30 percent higher um on average than Froom bus and um, and i you know i would love to just not 25 percent off the price but um we realistically can't do that because then there's just not enough money um, there's a number of things that that mean that currently electric bus operation is more expensive. Um, hopefully it won't be that way in the future as the technology and the infrastructure is more developed. But we had to factor into our bid the cost of installing the infrastructure and the, the cost, uh, the majority of the depreciation on, on a really expensive vehicle. Um, it, it comes, you know, it's it's about balancing risk, really. Um, there's a few, I mean, for any kind of politicians in the room or ones that have the ear of of uh, you know executive, um, the executive at the county councils, and I don't know, maybe your local MP. Um, the, you know, in order to be able to um deliver a competitive a financially competitive bid for a electric bus service um we really need to have longer contracts now i know all the reasons why local authorities don't want to commit to that and roughly speaking the contracts are four years which is approximately the political cycle between one administration and the next. Um, and there are lots of good reasons for that. You don't want to, you know, come into um, power in a county council or, you know, or even Westminster and find that, you know, you can't do anything because the previous authority signed you up for eight year contracts for literally everything. So you just sit on your hands for four years until it, it's all... <laughs> time to renew so um and of course you know nobody can predict councils can't predict more than four years ahead what their finances are going to look like they can sometimes not predict more than 12 months ahead what their finances are going to look like i remember in a you know i used to uh, be a councillor on brighton hove council i think quite a few people know that um and i was the lead councillor for finance um between 2020 and 2023, um, we we had to prepare our budget papers without even knowing what the government settlement was going to be. And then we had to amend our budget papers almost, you know, like in the last few weeks of, <laughs> of, of preparations um, based on what the government settlement actually you know actually was um so i understand all the reasons why councils don't give more than four year contracts but the reality is either you know if if we're going to transition to electric bus operation based on existing services and contracts um we either require 25 to 30 percent more funding or we require eight year contract in order to write down the huge capital cost over a, a longer period of time um so yeah that's that, that those are the big learnings you know it's always um it's always useful i think to take part in these exercises to then 
kind of fine tune and find out actually what yeah how how can we make it work it's a it's a shame that you know it would have been nice to have won at least one service and then we could have used that as a as a trial really to show what's possible for for the other you know for other towns a bit like we had planned for through um but yeah i think the the search continues really to <laughs> to find out you know to find what that uh you know what that looks like just been joined by my son raffi can i say hello okay right um and yeah um i mean in other in other news we are um you know we're we've recently um introduced electric buses in Bristol and Bath. Um, we've got uh, we've got um, three three electric buses now in our Bristol depot and that will be going up to five within the next couple of months. And that will mean that the uh, the 515 service in Bristol and the 20 service in Bath will be fully electrified. Oh lovely. <laughs> looks beautiful he's uh he's got a plant he's got a little den in the corner and he's um making it look nice um so yeah uh the you know electrification um continues in in those areas um interestingly those two services were won by you know, in public tender on ma majority, you know, fight with the majority of the um, waiting on financial. So um, it, it, it was, I think, probably the first and possibly up to up to now the only um, tender that that has been won in normal normal kind of financial and contractual um you know in a normal framework um and the the way that we did that was um with with second hand electric buses so they've all been um they've been uh you know renovated um refurbished with brand new batteries and brand new um drive systems and but but the bus itself is seven or eight years old um that yeah that means that we could we could procure the buses at much lower cost and it really came down to luck you know i think luck has a, a large part to play in a lot of these things um it just happened to be that that we managed to find six buses that had come off a contract uh somewhere else and we're looking for a new home and it was you know we're we're probably the only operator that is in the market for second-hand electric buses so um you know we we do get phone calls every now and again saying you know are you interested in this um which is you know it's it's good but it does also mean that you know you take your chances and we have had you know some have worked out really well and been really good value for money and others you know you you don't really know what you're getting until until you've got it um some of them come these these six came with a one year warranty which which was at least provided some peace of mind um we've also bought elect uh, second hand electric buses that have had no warranty at all and that's a bit more of a risk obviously um some of them have worked out really well and other ones uh you know we couldn't use at all um obviously the first thing we do is put them through uh yeah a, a servicing schedule and and um you know some some have kind of proven to be uh to kind of fail even preliminary testing so uh or or you you know you, you might also buy a second hand bus and and there are some that we've put in 
kind of silly offers on um based on yeah somewhere between 10 and 20,000 um based on just not knowing what it's going to turn out like and it might turn out very well and you've you've got a bus which potentially is worth 50 or 60k for 15 or 20 um other times you you know you buy it and run it for a week and then it dies and then that's the end of it that was an expensive <laughs> an expensive experiment um so yeah it's um there's a lot going on um there's a lot of learning going on uh exciting times for bristol and bath with with their first first electric buses for a a hundred years or so. I think there used to be electric buses in Bristol in the 19, 1903 or something. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, these are the first ones in in recent history, and that's that's exciting. Um, and we are looking, you know, we're looking for opportunities continuously in in you know in Somerset and Wiltshire. Um, but it's it's difficult to see how in the current kind of contractual and tendering uh environment with council finances as they are it's it's difficult to see how that's going to happen anytime soon i'm afraid um yeah i don't know if any, <laughs> that's about it i think um so uh any any questions um obviously for dave as well thanks thanks um, Tom, the theme of today is certainly finance. Um, Jane, uh, I think you've yeah. ready. I, to... I've I've got um, I've got questions for both. Um, with regard to Dave, um, you're talking about going to a unitary council. We are a unitary council in Wiltshire already. Um, and um, heads up here, my daughter lives in Froome. So when she came and said to me, what do you think about unitary councils, mum? Should I be voting yes or no? I have to say, I think a unitary council is a bonkers idea because time and again, it has been proven that the bigger something gets, the less relation it has to what people need now it's it's where we were i think you missed the beginning of the start of this conversation dave but it's where we were talking about potholes right at the beginning you know when you're on the doorstep people are saying to you what are you going to do about the potholes and the double yellow lines outside my house they aren't interested in what's happening at the potholes and the double yellow lines in trowbridge they want to know what's happening in in westbury so um my question, my first question for you is, we have what's called the area board, which is the um, three area Wiltshire unitary councillors. They sit together and they do what's called the area board. Nobody has the opportunity to comment to them. They just talk to each other. And it strikes me that perhaps you have a slightly better model. Um, is the area board what you have and you call it the community network? Yes, uh, I believe it is. Uh, I must admit, I'm not completely familiar obviously what, what's going on in, in Wiltshire, but I had heard there was something um, similar. So yes, I believe the, the your area boards um, are something similar to what we've got as the community networks okay now, um, and board. they do have some wider involvement as you've gathered uh yeah. if i will be honest the, the officers have restricted the especially the community organization membership um more than we would have wished but nevertheless anyone can turn up to the meetings and so they they are um so, so that, that that is that is helpful there's a lot of concern though that the lcns are just talking shops and some of the parish councils in particular are regarding them in that way um I, I, I mean i can i can see that and have sympathy with it um but they are continuing 
um, it is something I, I have wondered whether we should actually be saving the money and, and use the money on filling the potholes or doing whatever. Yes. Um, but uh, and in fact, that nearly was a choice we had when setting the budget last year. And certainly um, uh, at that time, I said we shouldn't be cutting the highways maintenance budget. If we've got to save money, cut the LCNs. In, in the end, we didn't go with the cuts to the highways maintenance budget that did was enough to stop that cut being taken um but and we have kept the lcns going but are trying to operate them a bit more cost efficiently uh i'm afraid we are unitary already our decision's being yes, taken i know so I, we're I know. a year into yeah. it now and yes yeah, share some of your points we had this debate uh, and i think what we found out is it was always being done to try and save money um, and that the, the biggest problems are at the county, um, what's become apparent is just how big the problems were at the county. Yes. And now the, the new councils, you know, brought the whole, bringing the whole lot down. Uh, but so Can that's I where we're, you, we're at. What is the size of your population in Wiverliscombe and Ooh. the size of the population in Dulverton? Just, you know, a ballpark. I should know this, shouldn't I? But uh, uh, Wivelscombe, I, I think, is somewhere around uh, two and a half thousand, uh, uh, maybe more than uh, than that, uh, two and a half, three thousand. That's uh, tiny. Dalverton probably is similar, but yeah, we're small towns. Uh, we're we're not big ones. So Wellington's much bigger. Uh, I don't actually know the size of Wellington, but I okay. guess it's more like ten thousand, uh, something like that. Maybe a bit more compared with. Taunton, which I'm guessing is about fifty thousand. Um, so, yeah. uh, um, I I'm interested um by what Tom said. As Tom started speaking, I made a note here and I wrote down "long game for transport." <laughs> and what did you talk about the need for a long game? I I would say. Um, I am also very involved with environment work within Westbury. And I would say that this whole transport issue, we've been looking at this for so long. It all comes down to selling it to people that if it's the old chicken and egg, if you offer them a service that is frequent and cheap, Will they get out of their cars and use it? Or do they just say, well, it's not very frequent and it's actually quite expensive. I may as well go in the car. So you're in this constant bind between the two things. And until we get serious about the environment, actually, it's going to be really hard to get over that. But I would say to you, uh, Dave, You've got to sell it to your communities. You've got to find the way, the pinch point where the only answer is yes. So you've got to offer, you've got to be brave and offer the system that people start saying, well, hang on a minute. There's a bus every 15, 20 minutes perhaps I ought to do that instead and and that's the thing I know in times when you're hard pressed for money and in times when everything looks bleak for everybody saying we're actually going to be brave and we're going to step through that door and offer people a real alternative to the car until you can do that you don't get the background of people the, of the community who say this is a great offer thanks jane i'm, I'm not sure a question there but there's certainly a statement uh we've yeah. got two hands up to pose questions peter peter wilhouse from Froome. peter thanks and and uh thanks everyone for your contributions this afternoon uh, um firstly an apology that i um joined the meeting late uh, uh but um tom i just wanted to pick up on on the point that you were making about the contract contractual conditions that would enable uh, the transition to electric buses um and that that point was was quite compelling 
Um, you said that in Bristol and Bath, you were assisted by the fact that your capital cost was relatively low because you took on secondhand buses. But can you just go into a little more detail in terms of the contractual conditions that you faced uh, in Bristol and Bath that might have maybe maybe uh, were a little um, a little more favourable? Uh, I don't know. It would be useful to know what what that situation was. Uh, yes, um, I think that's a really good question. And um, the the two tenders were were actually different in the way that they were designed. Um, broadly speaking, in with these kind of services, we we see two types of tendering method used, and one type is a I can't remember what their what their technical terms are, but uh, broadly speaking, one type looks at literally everything. They will look at your uh, your service, um, your uh, you know the kind of operating deliverability of it, uh, your track record for vehicle maintenance, for um, responding to breakdowns, for spare driver, spare bus ratios, and and so on, and then it will also look at your uh, proposals for marketing and your success in previous. It will look at um, your uh, commitment to local uh, local procurement, local labor, uh, apprentices, um, all, all sorts of social value. Uh, it will look at sustainability and carbon reduction. Um, and it will also obviously look at price. Uh, broadly speaking, they have a weighting. They, um, th I think the the Bristol uh, and Bath kind of West of England procurement was based around. Um, it's a, a sixty forty contract whereby I think sixty percent was was quality, all of the aspects of deliverability, marketing sustainability and social value and 40% on price. Um, in Wiltshire, it was a very different type of contract. Um, they have a minimum standard of, you know, do you have an operator's license? Are you financially solvent? Um, do you have a business continuity plan and the right insurance? And maybe one or two other things, but those, those are, yeah, it, it's literally the basic minimum you have to be a serious uh, supplier. Um, and then after that, once you meet that threshold, you're allowed to take part in the exercise. And the exercise itself in Wiltshire was 100% on price. Yeah. So as long as you meet the threshold, they're not interested in, I mean, I say they're not interested, I'm sure they are interested, but financially they've not given you any incentive at all to deliver quality of service to improve training for staff to improve uh resourcing the service from the local community to improve social value or sustainability or anything and once you've once you've reached the basic threshold then then literally they don't look at any of that they just look at the spreadsheet that has all the different prices that have been supplied um so i think obviously that's why we didn't win in wiltshire and that's why we did win in bristol and bath yeah tom, tom thank you for that and uh, just a, a supplementary question uh how long is the contract in the wecker area uh, how long is it, you know have you been able to to get something that's sufficiently long to meet the requirements of the company and um, it's a four-year contract great um and as I say, the only reason that is sufficiently long is because of the lower capital cost up front. Um, it wouldn't have been possible to do that with brand new electric buses no. uh, simply because they cost in excess of 300 grand each. Graham, okay, thank you. you. Graham Ellis. Okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I've got, got a whole lot of notes here. See if I can uh, 
work these out. Firstly, um, I would say that the area boards and the LCNs are very parallel. All I'm doing there is uh, doubling up and repeating what Jane has said. I found with the area boards here, they tend to be a group of councillors, and it's only the councillors on them who get a vote. Um, you can go along to there, you can observe or whatever. If you force yourself really hard and say it's an emergency, you can occasionally get an emergency question asked. Much to the disgust of the chair at the time, usually. Um, the area boards have... Our area has got six members, and there's a very similar number to our own Somerset. This is going to be about the same size, Dave. Um, and they have mem they have each of the members. They seem to go around in circles each year, uh, specialising in particular aspects of the area board. So I'm not trying to be funny, Jane, but you identify with this in Westbury as well, no doubt. Um, with the changes over and the changes around. Uh, I mean, I've had a particular issue recently with um, one of our experts who is a transport expert who um, reckons that a six-minute walk from the bus stop with an unsynchronised service every hour and a half to the railway station with, an, with a service every two hours is sufficient for people to transfer, including cross, going across a road, which is dangerous. Um... I disagree with him. However, a couple of conversations and various things ongoing. We have a year coming up to elections, and I think we may have some opportunities there where I'm talking with two or three of these people because everybody now is wanting to do things that come in favour and get things sorted out. And where we may have the opportunity still in Melksham is to put back that second vehicle because apart from Trowbridge of the towns you mentioned, Melksham is the largest town. I agree with the comments there about 15 to 20 minute frequency being good. I'd see the frequency not as being how frequent is the service, but how long you have to wait if you turn up at random at a public transport stop. So Fort William to Glasgow trains every 15 minutes would be absurd. The benefit we have here is we're looking at the station, looking at station transfer, and we have a tremendous amount of goodwill with passenger numbers up from 3,000 to 75,000 a year. And if you link the bus in line and on to the train service and properly connect it, which is what we did with the experiment with the test service, Tom, a couple of years back, then that there means the bus service does not have to be as frequent. It will work at hourly because the train is basically hourly. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff there I appreciate you probably got limited time, so I probably better not talk on till uh, midnight, had I? Thanks. But um, there are certain things to be looking at there and certain opportunities. But clearly, in this town, Froome Bus being the incumbent, the bus driver is known, the vehicles have probably got another four years' life back in them, and I find myself looking at Froome Bus, and I probably shouldn't say this, and say I don't know what their business continuity plan is. You've got one as well there. I also look at the local buses from Fairsaver, which to me seem to be, um, how do I put this gently? No two the same. And I think that's because of buses taking the second hand approach of coming off the end of use or whatever, and the quality of service is not particularly applicable. Thanks, Graham. Um, <clears throat> I'll hand over to I'm sorry. Uh, Dave. Um, we have a <laughs> fair saver. Um, Dave, incidentally, Wivelliscombe has got 4,000, and sorry, 3,000, and Wellington 14,000, according to Wikipedia. Um, but you've got you've raised your hand, sir. Good, thank you. Well, I'm glad you haven't embarrassed me. I, I was at least in the right ballpark, if uh, not quite spot on the numbers. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd um mentioned uh, that I've not been on Zoom. It took me ages to find where to raise your hand, uh, but uh, I, I got to it. Um, I, I was interested in what Tom was saying about the length of contracts, and I think there is a good point um, on on that one we do need to, to keep in mind. Um, the, the bit I thought I should contribute is other way other council services do have longer um, contracts, so um, it's possible 
um, and the one I particularly know well is, is waste. Um, so the previous contract was seven years plus three. And there are some parallels here because one of the biggest costs in waste is the vehicles. Um, and so Somerset has something like um, it's 130, 140, 40 vehicles involved in collection waste. Um, so, you know, that's a big vehicle spend there. Uh, and yes, it can't be spread over four years. It needs to be spread over longer, which was why uh, seven with the possibility of extension for a further three was possible. I think the current contract might actually be for 10 years right from the beginning with possibilities of extension beyond that. Um, so it, it looks as though it would be helpful if we could get the uh, council thinking along similar lines for, for buses. There may need to be a shift um, there. Uh, the, the thing I am sort of slightly mindful of is with waste, the statutory element of it is stronger. You know, you've got to collect the waste from every household. The, there is a statutory responsibility for public transport, but it's not quite as, as strong, um, uh, which, which doesn't help. But nevertheless, longer contracts. But yes, I really think we need to think uh, about that. So thanks for emphasising that point. Well, well made. That's a very interesting parallel to have drawn on um, the length of contract because I know talking with Tom that uh, and he's just emphasised it again today, the length of contract is, is a real issue, particularly for Somerset. Okay, um, we've slightly overrun our hour, um, but it's been a really interesting session. Thank you very much, Dave, um, and the challenges facing uh, Somerset and particularly West Somerset have been brought to our attention, but at least the LCN is is looking for ways forward and may well set an example in terms of what LCNs can do, because I know locally there's been a concern that they are a talking shop and not much else, but it sounds as if the talking is to good purpose down in the Wivaliscombe and Wellington LCN. And to Tom Druitt, um, thank you again. Thank you as always we really appreciate your continued interest in somerset and wiltshire um it'd be good when we can finally get some business done um but it's great that things are happening in weka um and i saw an electric bus a, a big lemon electric bus the other day in bath and it was it was a good sight so thank you very much and thank you to everyone for joining the call and thanks so much tom it's Mere words don't say it, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. You're welcome. And thank thank you all. And thanks, Dave, for a very interesting um, summary of situation in Somerset. Good luck with, uh, you know, going forward. It sounds like a big challenge you've got there. Great so, but uh, mm. we'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah. but th thanks very much. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Uh, thanks, yeah. Peter. Thank you. Thanks for chairing, Peter. See you later. Bye.